involves a communication between you and Mr. Conat or anything of the sort that I recall seeing. Um, there is some mention in there of uh, setting up opportunities for people to meet with Mr. Conat, and I think there's a reference to you that uh, break. Sure. I thought you might have a thing. Okay, so, um, so for the time being, Mr. O'Toole, just so we're on the same page, the email communications get to Mr. Hamaji and Mr. Presti immediately. Um, when it comes to the blue notes, we'll, we'll take another look at that. And frankly, Mr. Hamaji, I don't recall there being any summaries of communications. It was mostly scheduling issues about not being able to reach people and needing to call them back and those kind of things. Okay? All right, um, let's see. Is there anything else? Yes, there is. Uh, I received a brief from the defense entitled Trial Memorandum Regarding Admissibility and Scope of Mitigating Evidence. I believe it was sent to me on Saturday. Saturday. Yeah, that's correct, Your Honor. I'm sure that uh, the state hasn't had time to respond yet. I did file the original this morning. I put a copy for the court uh, sitting next to Ms. Hart up there on the three ring binder. Okay. Uh, but probably the state has been provided with a copy, so I don't think we need to argue that right at this moment, but it is uh, something that we want to make sure we No problem. And just for my own uh, help, uh, counsel, you mentioned Rupin here on page uh, five. Yes, I, I don't know who crafted the brief, so I'm putting you on the spot. I apologize. A little bit, but let's give it to right. Right. Well, there's mention in here that the Supreme Court has noted with you with approval, the presentation of 50 mitigation wit witnesses, and then there's the site to root. And for the life of me, I can't find even a, a brief passing reference to that fact, because that uh, that root opinion deals with the so-called no sympathy instruction. There was nothing in there that discussed the sufficiency of the <coughs> defense uh, mitigation witnesses. So I'm, if you could find where that comes from, that that would be helpful. I, just couldn't, I couldn't locate it anywhere. Maybe and, in the middle. Mr. Ross crafted this brief, Your Honor, and uh, I'm sorry. Okay. I have read it, but very quickly. If it's one in one of the earlier root opinions, just let me know. We, just, we won't find this correct citation. Okay, terrific. Thank you. So, folks, anything we need to take up uh, in addition to what we talked about already before we bring the jury in? I, I would just uh, note um, for the purpose of noting it that there are two best issues with respect to. are simply demanding a definite decision in advance of testifying? That's my understanding. Yes, yes essentially, we, we contacted, I believe, five separate officers, two transport officers and two deaf officers, okay. with the hope of actually putting on to testify one transport officer and two deaf officers. And we just said we wanted to talk to you for probably only about 10 or 15 minutes to find out what you have to say. They have all indicated, well, the ones that have responded have indicated that they do not want to voluntarily cooperate. They were just like court order. Um, and the, the offer that we made to them was when we have this informational interview, the prosecutor can be present and Ms. Fallon, or Ms. Balin, the uh, jail's attorney can be present. If they want to be official, I guess we'll file a short motion and just explain that we need to, to uh, find out what information they have before we just line to put them on the witness stand. All right. Um, so we'll, we'll file something short on that and um, obviously work with the state to Schedule. So the main thing is Ms. Bailey's on the board and knows exactly what's going on. Yes, she had indicated that I should contact various personnel in the in the DAJD system to set this up. And I have done that and like I said the officers who have responded have said they, they don't want to cooperate voluntarily. So we just need to All right, fair enough. Thank you. Mr. Tool. And may I ask just for a point of clarification whether the defense is seeking a order um, directly to us. I don't know what the request has been made. Sounds like a deposition. But they, sound, they said they wanted a deposition. As I explained to one of the officers when I um, was meeting with Mr. McEnroe on Friday, 
from a practical standpoint, it's the same. I, mean, I guess we bring the court reporter to your deposition. But we had assumed that any interview would be recorded anyway. Right. So, I mean, there's very little difference except the involvement of more bells and whistles and, and uh, personnel. Well, it's consistent with the court rules. Right. So it authorizes they, the deposition. So, I guess that's what they're demanding. If they, if they want that, they're certainly their right to ask for it. Okay, so let me know how that plays out, and if you need an order, we'll do that. Right, <coughs> put something together in writing. Great, thank you. So, uh, anything else? And I assume we're picking up with Mr. McEnroe again, right? Yes, Your Honor. Okay, anything else before we bring the jury in, folks? Uh, Great, thank you. And Mr. Majin, Mr. Trustee? Okay. All right, thank you. So, can you feed invite the jury in? Mr. McEnroe, if I could invite you back up there to stand, sir. I'll just get you in place quickly. It was, um, you know, it was a, it was okay in general, but it also had its, its low points. Like it would be, it'd be surprising the things that would go and kind of set her off. I mean, I wasn't used to living with anybody yet. That's how I've been, you know, basically the previous couple of years before I'd been living by myself and. Um, I never really had anybody who was like, okay, the living with somebody constantly right there who constantly wants your attention. And so that was kind of a, a source of friction right there. And we all, you know, just, it'd be just little things where I'm kind of not really paying attention, not really keeping in mind the fact that, for example, she would overheat easily, so she would always want me to open up the window. And the irony is, is that she'd be so concerned about security, and then she'd want the windows open, and like one of the windows is this one that's right over the balcony, where the um, the front balcony where people come up the stairs and they walk by, and you know it's like right there. So she wants the window that's opening up right on the stairs to be open. And it's like that always kind of bothered me. Uh, so I go put that off until the last minute, and then she'd come in and say, "Okay, you're deliberately not trying. You deliberately don't count. Slow. Sorry, you deliberately aren't um, keeping in mind that I've got this problem that I have this extra layer, and so it's like you don't even care. Why don't you care? You but, know." But Joe, for all that, there was some love and feeling. No, there was there was a lot. You know, I mean. Okay. Yeah. Let me ask you: the state introduced. Um, during the, the first part of the trial, 
what was State's Exhibit 166. Okay. And I'm just going to put that, if I may, in our Elmo here. And this was this. Uh, this was a, a notebook that I guess had been found um, in your single wide after you were arrested, right? Yeah. And could you describe for us generally what this notebook was? This is a notebook that we kept around to um, kind of leave messages back and forth. So once I was walking. Once I was walking, it took a little while uh, for the um, for the HR guy to come on to come back from his vacation, so I could start walking again. I would um, I was just would differ sometimes, so I leave a message for her, and she'd leave a message for me, and so on. Were you so working forth. opposite shifts or something? Or? Mm. I. Might happen actually. I think I might have been walking overnight at that point. Yeah, I was walking overnight at that point. She was walking during the day. Okay. Yeah, so, so. Uh, and let's just read a, a couple um, brief entries here. I have, I guess the, the exhibit is not stamped with production numbers. Um, uh, yeah. But I, I do have a production number here. I guess it doesn't make any sense to refer to it. It's not in the exhibit. Why don't you just read the top of that page there? Is that a note from Michelle to you? I can't. Can you no, I can't even see it all day. Let me give you a copy of Exhibit 166 Thank you. and ask you to read the top of it. Okay. It says, um, starting from up here. Start at the top there. Okay. Joe, I love you. Help yourself to lunch and eat bread, muffins, or eggs. Hold on, slow down. Sorry. Very, very top of it. Joe, I love you so much. I love you. Help yourself to the lunch and eat bread, muffins. Oh, me from down here? From uh, I love you so, so much. Sorry, I'm confused. Let's see what you're looking at. Make sure we're looking at the same page. Right? We're not looking at the same page. Okay. Can I ask what, what your production number is? Three two two three. Sorry, because there's no production numbers in this journal. I love you so much. Did you know that? Did you know that I love your handwriting? Well, I do. And you know what else? I love everything about you. You're perfect in every way. Love you. Mr. Rose will point out, I do have the wrong page up here. I apologize. Look at this. Um, Exhibit 166. Okay. Exhibit 166. so much. Do you know that I love your handwriting? Well, I do. Do you know what else? I love everything about you. You're perfect in every way. I love you. Shall I go? You're perfect in every way. Love you. Shall I go? And then, you know, okay, and then, and then there's a little, uh, can I have that back from Mitchell? Of course. Sorry. And then there's a little drawing after she does that, a little cat in the heart. No, it's uh, Pikachu, actually. It's a what? Pikachu. What's a Pikachu? It, it's a Pokemon. Oh, Pikachu. It's Pika? It's, it's a uh, Pokemon, actually. It's a uh, Pikachu. That's why it's the same Pika. So that's some kind of a, a, a cartoon character? Yeah, it's a cartoon, cartoon character. Yeah, it's a cartoon character. Okay. 
Okay, so I mean that seems in looking at that, it seems like that seems like a pretty, you know, friendly relationship you're having, right? Yeah. No, I mean sometimes it really was really nice. I mean, especially during the beginning, a lot of the times it was really good. And especially during the beginning. Me, Joe, that the, the tone of a lot of those notes back and forth between you guys in exhibit one sixty six is is similar. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean there's a lot of I love you's back and forth and um, yeah. Just information filling each other in on, on how the day is going or whatever. Yeah. Okay. Um, now there's another reference in here I want to ask you about, and this is going to be on production page 3232. I'm not going to even try to find it in the unmarked copy, but I'll put up 3232 for a moment and then ask you to read it and explain this. Explain it. That's the page right there. Are there some more Pokemon drawn on there? Yeah. Okay. The one on the bottom is the uh, Pikachu, the one, uh, the other one's on Woopons. Woopons. Woopers, W-H-O-O-P-E-R-S. Yes. Correct. Joe, would you just read this paragraph at the top here? And, okay. Um, and then I'm going to ask you a question about it. Hey, Joe, I'm going to go to the store after I come home and change. If you end up at the store... Joe, down a little, please. Sorry. I'm going, hey, it's Joe. I'm going to go to the store after I come home and change. If you end up going to the store before then, just pick up some home milk for you. It's too dangerous to get water and a lot of he and a lot of heavy things without the calm. I'm in no rush. I won't get you, I won't get your home milk if you don't make it to the store. So no worries. I love you so very much. You are so great. Love you. And how did she sign that? Shelly, calm. So would you explain, please, what is so dangerous about getting water? Because then my uh, getting water or other heavy things would go and um, it would, you know, tie my hands up. So if I had to, if I was in some kind of dangerous situation, if something happened, I wouldn't be able to fight if it came down to it or not quite so well. But most I would be able to fight if my hands were full with, you know, a gallon of water, three gallon thing of water. Okay, but you're living in Kent at this point, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we're right down the street from the, uh, I mean, the store's literally right on the other side of the street. Yeah, on Friday, I thought you said that you saw yourself as some kind of garbage, right? Yeah. But you also said you don't like to fight, right? Well, there's, there's a difference. I mean, I mean, the question, though, is if you're a guardian, how can you be a guardian and not like to fight? Well, the best guardians, I have to mention that the best guardians don't like to fight. I mean, I mean, think about cops. I mean, would you want the cop around who likes to fight? Or a cop around who is trying to do everything he can to prevent a fight? There's more to guarding that, and protecting somebody than going and, you know, actually fighting. Most of it is avoiding fights and avoiding danger. You know, as opposed to actually going out and, I mean, there's guarding and then there's war. A warrior is somebody who goes out and seeks danger, who seeks fights, who looks to fight. A guardian is somebody who tries to do everything he can to prevent fights, and then if it comes to a fight, then doesn't he can't go and end the fight without with the least amount of damage necessary. Okay. So Joe, you moved to, I think you testified, uh, you moved out to Seattle April 2, 2002, is that right? Something like that, yeah. And the first place you lived with Michelle was the same place she had lived with Mark Mann, Kent Terrace Apartments? Yes. And approximately when did you move from Kent Terrace to the next place? I say about a year later. About a year later? Mm -hmm. And from this same uh, notebook, Exhibit 166, uh, during the, uh, the state's case in chief, Mr. O'Toole had uh, Detective Tompkins read a part about buying a gun here. I believe this is production number 3257A. Have you read it so everybody remembers exactly what we're talking about? Okay. This, this, this small portion at the top of the page here. Okay. Uh, hi. Let me know when you wake up so we can so we can get the gun. I really don't like leaving it longer than absolutely necessary. Love you. Ciao. So 
Were you still in Kent Terrace when you got the gun? I believe so. Had you, do you, um, did you get it in response to this thing with the kids climbing the balcony? Or Actually, just... yeah. Because, I mean, up until that point, she, it, it's kind of, um, you know, I mean, she had always seen, she had always been really worried about, okay, well, we're in a bad area, and, you know, people are always trying to infringe on our rights and trying to attack us and trying to get over on us, and this would be something that she was always re very concerned about, is people trying to get over on her and uh, trying to take advantage of her. And because she was, as she put it, a little fat girl. That's not my way of putting it, that's how she put it. Um, so, at first, I'm just like, look, you know, you come, you came from living in the country, this is just how people are in the city. It's not, it's not that big of a deal, you know? I mean, people go off and like, you know, they make a lot of noise and they act wild because that's what people do, you know? It's not a big deal. And then we have these people, then we've got these lunatics trying to go off and like climb up on the balcony yet. Lunatics. Yeah. Trying to climb up on the balcony, it's like, Okay, maybe you're not paranoid. Um, Hold on, Joe. Let me ask you something. Okay. You said you moved, you thought you moved to Kent Terrace about a year, excuse me, from Kent Terrace to, where did you go, Ridian Ridge? Yes. About a year later? Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to come back to Exhibit 166, but first I want to make a brief reference to um, Exhibit 17. Sorry, we're picking the trash can. Mm. Um, exhibit 179A, and this is going to be production page 5426. Sorry. Sorry about that. That's what that looks like right there on 5426. And Joe, I'm going to have you read Okay. In the middle of the page, can you read that paragraph right there, please? Yes. First, read the date. Okay. 9.29.03 a.m. We've been moved into the new place for just over a week now. I'm pretty happy here, though rather tired. Moving is quite a spot. Though rather tired. Moving is quite a spot walk. I have no day in some time. Sorry it took me a while to find this. Please. Sorry. Um, I haven't updated in some time. Sorry, it took me a while to find this again. Okay, so it's dated end of September 2003. Yes. And it says we've been moving to the new place for a week now. Yes. So would that, would I be correct in concluding from that that maybe you didn't move to Radian Ridge until September 2003? That does seem to be appropriate, yes. Okay. There was also evidence introduced as to when you, you guys first got a gun, right? Yes. And the first gun that y'all got was a 357? Yes. And that was purchased in December 2003? Yes. Was it? I believe it was. Okay. Um, so with that, well, you know, I guess I'll object on one question of who's testifying. I'll just point the objection and ask another question. Well, uh, certainly the... the uh, there was testimony at the, at the guilt trial from the okay. gentleman who um, was from Japanese gun show. Right? Yes. And he introduced the um, the registrations from the guns and the receipts and that sort of thing, correct? Right? Yes. Now, I may be incorrect in this, but I had thought that, that you had bought that first gun in December 2003. And if you don't remember, you can just... Yeah, I don't remember. That's why I'm saying I'm That's guessing fine. that you're correct because... That's perfectly fine. Yeah. I'm sure the jury's notes will reflect that. Okay. Um, but you got that gun in response to what? Like, was there a specific event or more general events? My memory was that we had gotten that gun specifically because we were concerned about safety. You know, okay. I mean that's the entire point of going off lane. Like, I mean, the 357 is it's a strong enough gun that it's that it would usually be enough to go off and like, stop somebody, right? But it's not uh, too big of a gun for most people to use. It's, we use holocrons because they wouldn't go off like, you know, they'd be less likely to break through a wall or something. And also, that size of gun is not 
it's big enough to help to you know to stop something, but it's not also it's also not big enough to like really do a lot of damage or like tail through walls or anything. Okay, but it did wind up doing quite a heck of a lot of damage, didn't it? Yeah, it okay. did actually. Okay. So. so but you said you brought the gun to the concerned about safety, right? Absolutely. Okay. I just want to ask you a couple other questions about this, all right? Okay. There's another entry in this um, journal here that's exhibit 166. And I just want to ask you about um, Production page 3257E. And this appears to be a paragraph written and then some kind of map. Is that right? Yes. Okay. And I'm going to hand it to you. Okay. And ask you to please read the paragraph and um, explain what the map shows. Okay. The. Uh says, Joe, I'm taking the bus to walk because I'm afraid of my calm free freezing shut. <coughs> of my calm freezing shut. It was uh, very cold at that particular point. I didn't call the field super because I'm afraid he'll get into a car accident. I'm taking the bus home. I catch at 6.07 a.m. and it gets into the bus stop in Kent around 3, 6.35 a.m. I'll call you before I leave Renton or while riding the bus. When I get to the bus stop, I'm going to start walking you. I walk on the side closest to Wells Fargo Bank. I'm watching. On the side closest to Wells Fargo Bank. I love you so much. I love you. So and what exactly does the map show? It shows um. It shows the uh, route that she'll be taking from the um, from the bus stop to Meridian Ridge. To Meridian Ridge. Yeah, which is where we left living at that time. And about how many blocks is it from the bus stop to Meridian Ridge? About one, maybe two. One to two blocks? Yeah. And this map here, you, you said it depicts which side of the street she's going to be walking on? Yeah. And that, are those these little arrows here? Exactly, yeah. And then down here it says Meridian Ridge? Yep. Why would it be necessary to draw such a detailed map for such a short walk? In case anything happens. Well, were you out there to meet her or something? I... You know, I don't remember. I don't think so. Okay. Um, we had... Uh, I think the last thing we talked about Friday was the kids climbing the balcony, and so I want to follow up with that with a few more... Um, of the things that you were writing at the time in your journal about what was going on and the feelings you were having. Can I mention something, Foss? Yeah, I, I guess I should probably take it. You have to have a question. I was going to try to ask a question. All right, thank you. Good uh, Mr. McEnroe, was there any other relevant details <laughs> about the Meridian Ridge map thank you. that you just looked at? Um, not that I can think of offhand, no. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask you next about about this journal that you kept back in, okay. uh, back in at least the first place in Kent. Now this is State's or State Defense Exhibit 179 and then the production number of property is 179A. And I want to first ask you um, about page 5417. And I'll just and I'm not going to try to show the actual journal because without the production numbers, it's just too difficult to uh, figure out where things are. That would be a good idea. But in general, why don't you first describe what was this book? Was it a journal? I honestly can't tell from you. I can't see that very well. Okay. Let me hand it to you. This is Mark 179A. Okay. And have you hold that page? What in general is that book? Oh, this is my journal. That is your journal. Yes. And what? How have you always kept a journal, or is it something you've done in different parts of your life? Um, it's something that I have done in different parts of my life. Um, just I can't even say why. I don't know. It's just um. Sometimes I believe. Sometimes I, would, you know, uh, keep a journal. Other times not. I think this is like. 
Well, this is one of the few times I actually did bother keeping a journal. This is one of the uh, few times I did bother keeping a journal. That you did bother keeping a journal? That I did. Okay. Yeah. Now, um, page 5417, you have that page? Yes. And in the middle of the page, there's a date. Do you see that? Yes. Is that, and what is that date? That is 9703 a.m. Okay. So, September 7, 2003? Okay. Wait a second, I'm asking you questions. That, what that means, I want to make sure you're not writing it back. No. No, it is September 7th. Uh, okay. So, based on the entry that we read a few minutes ago, you, would you still be in Kent Terrace Apartments at this point? You hadn't moved to Meridian Ridge yet? I believe that's correct, yes. Okay. And I'm gonna, I might interrupt you a little bit here, but um, Mr. O'Toole quoted from this a bit uh, during his case, and I want to ask you to read through it. I'm going to ask you some questions about it. Okay. I also want to note that the next two pages have drawings on them, so um, as you read forward, you can skip over. We don't need the description of the drawings I'm asking you about the journal. Okay? Okay. So would you please read and, and just try to read uh, slowly so yeah. we can all understand. Okay? Sorry. It's okay. Um, I would have sworn that I would have sworn I'd really have needed to kill someone today. From about seven till nearly ten, the neighbor kids, well, more like middle school to high school age, kept climbing onto the balcony below all below our own. The people down the people down there from the the mom from the side of it got very uh, the mom from the side of it got very understandably upset that there was a good twenty people climbing onto a balcony and running through her opponent. I got my sword and it sounded like they were trying to slow down please Joe. Okay. You got your what? I got my sword when it sounded like they were trying to figure out how to get up on our balcony. But the people downstairs got tired of the game and locked them out. They uh they reacted in the obvious fashion fashion. They tried to break down the door. I was so scared they tried to get up. I was so scared they tried to get up here. In hot shell if they and, and what Joe? In hot shell. If they had, there wouldn't be, there wouldn't be any, if they had, there wouldn't be any more scene. My family, if they had, there wouldn't be any more scene. My family's betrayed me. My friends, my friends are lies and not, just not close. She's all I have. And there's nothing more dangerous than a man with nothing to lose. On a side note, try to call her mom today. Still no go. Useless bitch. Sorry. So... Um, that sounds pretty aggressive to me. Let me ask you something. What, what, did you take any steps to go out and, and fight these people? Or something against them? No, no, what I did was, um, actually I sat behind the, um, I sat behind the, um, we had a sliding glass storm on the balcony, and I sat behind the sliding glass storm with this sword. It's funny because it wasn't even, even a very good sword. Um, but I sat there, wait, you know, waiting to see if anybody would come up and try and do anything. But and, and did they? Nobody managed to come up now, so there was no reason to do anything. Okay, so let's have you pick up what's the next journal entry. That is uh, 973 nine seven a.m. Fossil. Oh, hold on. 973? Yeah. I don't know. Um, it's the same day, though. So could three just mean 2003? Yes. Okay. I guess. Uh, was so. That, was that the same day as it was on the prior yes. entry? Yeah. Okay. And in fact, uh, the date stamp says AM, falls on. So it refers back to the uh, previous one. Okay. Yeah. You would continue reading it again. Just try to keep the court reporter in mind and, and go slowly enough. You know, right. Catch it. Sorry, um, I'm going to uh, use a bit of foul language show. Pardon me. Yes, uh, sorry about that. Fuck's sake! It sounds like these little assholes are back. If we get Bob Scott's gun, I'll have. I'll go buy a gun uh, from. If we get, sorry. Fuck's sake! It sounds like these little assholes are back. If we can't borrow Scott's gun, I'll buy a shotgun from a pawn shop. If we can't borrow Scott's gun. I buy a shotgun from a pawn shop. Don't push me. I don't care what you do. But you fuck with me, you'll never fuck with anyone else again. I'm sure if I do something, this will end up being evidence. Premeditated moral. 
Yeah. Hold on. Premeditated murder, and then you just said the irony. Which is uh, just a side note. So that's not in. That's not in the now. Okay. Yeah. And at this point, who were you concerned about, and who were you scared? I was scared of the people who were climbing up the balcony. Okay, so this notation doesn't refer to any fear, correct me if I'm wrong, does it refer to any fear of the Anderson family? Absolutely not, no. Okay. So, um, and next, next line begins? Wrong. I'm just tired of being screwed. I'm back into a corner at the end of my rope. I'm just tired of being screwed. I'm back into a corner and at the end of my rope. I know you can't understand. You live in a nice place, secure the knowledge that you won't have some psycho kids, kids that have nothing better to do than destroy the nice things they can't that have nothing better to do than destroy the nice things they can't have. You believe they won't leave you believe they won't leave their diamonds, they'll get a rip away everything you all do. Joe, you gotta slow down a little You believe they won't leave their tenements, they'll get up and rip away everything you all do. But maybe you feel it, but maybe you do feel it. Maybe when you try to get around a bunch of thugs look at your... <laughs> maybe when you drive through the ghetto and a bunch of thugs look at your nice suit, your fine car, your beautiful wife, maybe you feel it then where I am right now. I don't have a nice suit or a nice car. I only have Shelly. I think they feel me as much as I feel them. I wonder if they hate me as much as I hate them. I hate them for what they are. Not race, not creed, no, because of what they are. Entropy embodied. They, to me, are an idiot chaos. Born and torn to destruction. Youth wasted on ruining lives. Do you want... Youth wasted on ruining lives. Do you understand? God help you if you do. Uh, let me just ask you... Yes. Sorry about that. Entropy embodied. Yeah. They, to me, are an idiot chaos. Very profound, but what in the world's it mean? Just. The whole. Destruction for destruction's sake. What are you referring to, or who are you referring to? These. Just these people who... Who that's all they do is just destroy and take and just... They don't care, they just... They don't what? They don't care, it's just... I'm not actually referring to anybody in specific at this point, I don't think. I think the whole, um, the whole, uh, people climbing up the balcony and stuff has kind of set me on a sort of, um, overall grumpy mood, um, where I'm sitting here and reflecting that, getting angry about, I don't know, people just, don't care who just would destroy stuff just to destroy stuff. Did you see these kids actually destroy anything? No. I don't even think I was actually specifically talking about these kids. So. Um, when you growing up, I mean, obviously you weren't wealthy, right? Yeah. Was there any kind of a feeling of like, us against them, all these rich people that have it better than me, and they must have really easy lives. Do you have any feeling like that? Well, and not so much us against them, it's more of there was the awareness that I was, that we were, that we were these, um, just more of those people who were kind of living off of them, that they knew that and really kind of hate us for it. Um, that there was the view that, you know, I was a parasite, that I and us were just, you know, my family were just these worthless people who didn't contribute anything to society or 
do anything of value. And it's, I don't know, I mean, it's not everybody, but there was, I mean, there was enough people, I mean, even my teachers who would go point out that, okay, yeah, you have these welfare people who are these worthless people who just sit there and they just leech and they don't add anything, they don't contribute anything. So. A teacher actually made a comment about that? Well, there was a number of teachers that were like that, yeah. They just, you know, that was one of the reasons that I ended up like leaving school because it's like, they resented me, they actually didn't want me though. And part of it was this, this discussion of being on welfare, is that it? Just, yeah, you know, that I was this worthless poor person, you know? I'm sorry. Worthless poor person. Um, let me have you pick up and read the next journal entry there that begins. Okay. Uh, 9-8-2003, and um, if you would just read that next entry, please. Okay. Haven't had to kill anyone yet, so I guess things aren't all bad. Unfortunately, we still don't have a gun. I feel a lot better if we did. I'm so stressed right now. Anyway, Shell goes back to home tonight. Let me interrupt you for a second. You're so stressed, you were working at Target at the time? Yes. And the stress was coming from what? These people who were climbing the balcony and acting like psychos. And doing what? And acting like psychos. Okay. Okay. Anyway, Shell goes back to work tonight, and it'll probably be a couple more days until we get some firepower. That bothers me. We were going to get the gun that Scott had, but Ryan took it back just when we needed it. We wasted all yesterday waiting to find that out. I was hoping we'd be armed instead of... Instead of the best we have is a half-sharp sword and a nice knife. Half-sharp sword and a nice knife. Oh, and my wards. They seem to be walking well so far, for the sake of all involved. Let's hope they hold. And your wards? Yeah, not war. Oh. Not wards. Not W R R D S, but wards. W A R D S. W A R D S? Yeah. Okay, now Dr. Dutton talked about this. Please, if you would, tell us about, about wards. It's, um,. It's a form of, it's just a burial um, of, it's a, it's a kind of spiritual uh, burial to go and keep. The whole idea is to keep people, is to keep, um, you create a, I don't know, a, a consequence burial, right? Consequence yeah, to put it in the uh, best way, simplest way I can. It's not something that I've really spent a lot of time trying to explain or trying to figure out exactly how to explain. Uh, what it is, is um, trying to keep, trying to keep uh, negative energy and negative negativity from, not negativity, but if you cross this line, then in trying to go off like do something bad, then something bad might happen to you and I don't want that I don't want anything bad to happen to me and I don't want anything bad you don't want anything bad to happen to you. And likewise, so don't you know, it's well, and yet I don't actually go out and like say, hey guy you know, it's just it's um kind of a spiritual construct. A spiritual construct. Well how do you make a ward? How do you ward something? Um, I mean, is this like Harry Potter protecting his tent when he was running from the bad guys? No, no, it's, uh, I don't think so anyway. Um, no, it's, um, uh, no, it's just, uh, focused, uh, energy, that's all. Well, how do you do it? Like, let's say you wanted to protect this table. You would... How do you know it? You would focus on what you don't want to happen to it. Right, and focus on um, drawing energy t into uh, kind of a weave around it, a, a weave around it.
to uh, sort of weave or mesh around it of, uh, of consequence of, okay, well, you know, I don't want somebody to go and, like, break this table because if you break this table, then the table you broke, and then you'd have to go off and, like, pay for a new one, and not, you don't want to have to pay for a new one, and I don't want to have to have a broken table, so. So do you have a bond or something? I mean, what do you no, do? no, it's, it's entirely, it's entirely um, internal, actually. That's a war. There was also a reference to a, to binding. Binding. a binding is sort of like a warden, but it's more a um, uh, warden is uh, kind of place specific. It's uh, stationary, whereas a binding is more of person specific, where you're actually actually focused more of person specific. What you're actually doing is you're focusing on a particular person and trying to constrain them from uh, taking wrong action. That would go and do, that would be uh, destructive. How long have you been warding and binding things? At least since Arizona. Probably before then. Arizona? Yeah, Which probably before then. At least it's the second time. What got you started on this? I have no idea. I, actually, I think most of this is stuff that uh, Crow showed me how to do. Does Sylvia Brown mention this stuff? I don't know. Um, not in the ones that I read. The most that I got from Silly Brown is um, some back to some of the things that Crow had said and some what? Some uh, reinforcement to some of the things that Crow had said, but my views mostly came from what Crow told me or showed me. Not from Silly Brown. Silly Brown was was something that Michelle had gotten her ideas from, not me, not really. But you read some of those books, right? Of course.